So let's look at the four major regions of the brain. We've already discussed the cerebrum, the diencephalon, which consists of the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus, the brain stem, which consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, which is what we're getting ready to discuss, and finally, the cerebellum, which will be the last major region of the brain that we will be covering. So the brain stem is positioned between the cerebrum and the spinal cord as you can see from this illustration right over here. So here's my cerebrum and here is my brainstem. So the brainstem will provide pathways for tracks, which again are myelinated axons. So they're white matter that will run up and down connecting the higher and lower brain centers. The brainstem will have centers that produces program automatic behaviors that are referred to as visceral reflexes, which is absolutely necessary for survival. Now, we have a total of 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Well, it turns out that out of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 10 of them, the nuclei can be found along the length of the brain stem, which, by the way, has a length of approximately three inches. So the brain stem is not very long at all. So going back to the 12 pairs of cranial nerves, the only two pairs of cranial nerves that do not have a nuclei that we find in the brain stem will be the olfactory nerve, which is cranial nerve number one, and the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two. So once again, out of the 12, these two the nuclei are not located along the length of the brain stem. So let's look at these various images that I've included in this particular slide. So we'll begin with this image right over here. So this is showing us the inferior surface of the brain. So imagine that we're looking up. So once again, the brain stem consists of the midbrain. So I'll highlight the midbrain in this light green highlighter. The pons, which I'll highlight in yellow, and the medulla oblongata that I'll highlight in my blue highlighter. So once again, this is the brain stem. And we have another image over here. So the midbrain, so we're gonna be talking about the components of the midbrain. The pons, we'll look at the function of the pons. And finally, the medulla oblongata. And we have another image right over here, and this time this is the anterior view of the brainstem. So looking at the images down over here, here is the ventral view. So what I'd like you to do is carefully look at the ventral view and see if you can identify the various components of the brainstem. Here's the left lateral view, and finally the dorsal view. So the next thing that we're going to look at is the midbrain, which is the first component of the brainstem. So hopefully by looking at these illustrations, it's obvious that the midbrain would be the most superior part of the brainstem, while the medulla oblongata will be the most inferior part of the brainstem. And of course, sandwiched between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata will be the pons. So the most superior component or part of the brainstem is the midbrain. The midbrain is also referred to as the mesencephalon. It regulates auditory and visual reflexes and as well as it controls alertness. When we look at the ventral side or the anterior side of the midbrain, what we find are two bulging structures referred to as the cerebral peduncles that form pillar-like structures. And it turns out that these cerebral peduncles are tracks consisting, once again, of white matter. Why? Because they're myelinated axons. Don't forget, these tracks are descending tracks and ascending tracks. Basically, they're projection fibers. So these tracks, which we find, once again, as part of the cerebral peduncle, will connect the primary motor cortex, which is also referred to as the precentral gyrus, that we find in the parietal lobe of our cerebral cortex with the somatic motor neurons found in the spinal cord. So we refer to these tracks as the corticospinal motor tracks. Now, what type of tracks are they? 
They are descending tracks. Why? Because we're basically going from the primary motor cortex, which is the cerebral cortex, as it descends to the somatic motor neurons, which are found in the spinal cord. So I hope it's obvious that these cortical spinal tracts are descending tracts. They're going down. So as they descend towards the spinal cord, they will carry voluntary motor commands that are part of the somatic nervous system. And this is all issued by the cerebral cortex, specifically the cerebral cortex that we find in the parietal lobe, one of which is the precentral gyrus, also called the primary motor cortex. So let's quickly look for the cerebral peduncles. So we'll look at the image down over here to the bottom left-hand corner, and I've already highlighted the midbrain, and here is those pillar-like structures that is found on the anterior or ventral side of the midbrain. And if we look at this image over here, the anterior view, here is your cerebral peduncle. So I'll highlight this all in blue, and again, take note of how they look like. They're pillar-like. And of course, we have two cerebral peduncles, one on the right and one on the left. So this is what's going to contain these tracts of white matter, myelinated axons. And if we look at this image over here, which I did not include in your slide, so right here, folks, are your cerebral peduncle. And again, tracts, white matter, myelinated axons. Now, the midbrain is connected to the cerebellum, one of the major regions of the brain, through a structure called the superior cerebellar peduncle. Now, no, do not confuse the cerebellar peduncle with the cerebral peduncle. They're two separate structures. So the cerebellar peduncle consists of the superior cerebellar peduncle, the middle cerebellar peduncle, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So once again, what connects the midbrain to the cerebellum is the superior cerebellar peduncle. Now, what will they contain? Ladies and gentlemen, they too will contain tracts, myelinated axons, white matter. Now, in addition to the descending fibers, we also will find ascending sensory information that is carried to the higher brain centers. So I hope it makes sense that these would be ascending tracks of white matter or myelinated axons as it goes through the cerebral peduncles. Now, if we look at the dorsal side or the posterior side of the midbrain, we have four structures that when we combine them, we form the corpora quadra gemina, and these will contain sensory nuclei. So once again, this is now going to be gray matter, okay? So we have two superior colliculi and two inferior colliculi for a grand total of four. This is why it's referred to as the corpora quadra gemina. So let's first look at the superior colliculus. So the superior colliculus will receive visual inputs from the retina of our eye and will respond to visual stimuli. Why is that? Well, it turns out that the superior colliculus, or if we're looking at both of them, the superior colliculi, will be part of our visual reflex centers. So this is what's going to coordinate or control the reflexes that are involved in the movement of the eyeball, the head, and neck in response to visual and auditory stimuli coming from the inferior colliculi. For example, if you see a bright light flash on your left side, you immediately will turn your head and neck and as well as your eyeballs as you look at that bright flash of light that has just flashed along your left side. That's because of your superior colliculi. Now, what about the inferior colliculi? Well, the inferior colliculi is part of the auditory relay. So how this works 
is our hearing receptors in our ear, specifically our inner ear, that information is sent to one of the inferior colliculus, which is then transmitted to the thalamus, the relay center, which then relays the information to the primary auditory cortex. Of course, this is associated with a sense of hearing. Now, as part of this auditory reflex center, the inferior colliculi will communicate with the superior colliculi. Therefore, if you hear a loud bang, let's say on your right side, all right, so you hear a loud pop or a loud bang, your auditory reflex inferior colliculi will then communicate with the superior colliculi. Therefore, you now will turn your head and your neck as well as your eyeball to the right. Why? Because you've heard that loud bang on your right side. Once again, that's part of this auditory reflex center. So what I want to show you is this image right over here on the left-hand side. And this is just meant to illustrate the auditory relay that I just mentioned. So your cochlea is part of your inner ear. So when we hear something, that information is sent to the inferior colliculus, okay, which again is found on the dorsal or the posterior side of the midbrain. So if you look carefully at the arrows, that information makes its way eventually to one of the inferior colliculus. Then up to the thalamus it goes. From the thalamus, that information is then relayed to the auditory cortex, which we find in the cerebral cortex, specifically at the temporal lobe. And this will allow us, once again, to hear sounds. So this is the auditory relay that the inferior colliculi is part of. Now, one thing I want you to note is that if we hear the sound on the right side, that information is going to make its way to the left cerebral hemisphere. In other words, to the auditory cortex found at the left cerebral cortex. The auditory cortex, of course, that's part of the temporal lobe. If the sound is coming from the opposite ear, the left ear, then that then will be sent to the right side of our brain, the right cerebral cortex. In other words, the right cerebral hemisphere, specifically the right auditory cortex, which once again we find in the temporal lobe. The second and middle component of the brain stem will be the pons. Pons literally means bridge. What we find within the pons are nuclei, clusters of gray matter that are referred to as pons nuclei. We also will find tracks, tracks that will carry or relay both sensory and motor information. Sensory going up and motor information going down. So in other words, they will contain projection fibers that travel in two directions. So the ascending tracks, which are going up, will carry information, sensory information that is, from the lower areas of the central nervous system to higher brain centers, while the descending tracts will carry motor commands from higher areas of the central nervous system to lower areas of the central nervous system. In addition to these ascending and descending tracts, we will also find fibers that run horizontally or transversely, which we refer to as transverse fibers. So if we look at the images down below, here are those ascending and descending tracks that we'll find going through the ponds, ascending going up and descending going down. In addition, we also find these transverse fibers that run horizontally, so basically side to side. Now it turns out that these transverse fibers will continue on and form what's called the middle cerebellar peduncle. So this middle cerebellar peduncle is what will link the pons with the cerebellum, therefore allowing sensory and motor information to and from the cerebellum. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let's look at this image on the upper right-hand corner. So once again, here's your cerebellar peduncle. We've already talked about the superior cerebellar peduncle that links the midbrain to the cerebellum. 
But what we're focusing on now is the middle cerebellar peduncle. So once again, this is what's going to link the pons to the cerebellum. And we can even see it down in this image on the bottom right hand corner. So here once again are your pons. So if you look carefully, you'll see these black lines that are running side to side or horizontally. So in essence, what they're forming is the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now, in addition to all this white matter, these tracks, myelinated axons, we also once again find the pons nuclei, which are gray matter. So the nuclei that I would like you to know are the following. So the first one is involved in respiration. In other words, breathing. So we refer to one of these pons nuclei as the pontine respiratory group. And what this will do is it will communicate with the respiratory centers that we also find in the medulla oblongata. So what this pontine respiratory group will do is it's going to modify the respiratory rate. In other words, how many breaths we take per minute, how fast we breathe or how slow we breathe. And that is because this pontine respiratory group, one of these pons nuclei, will communicate with the respiratory centers that we also find in the medulla oblongata. So we will discuss these respiratory centers when we look at the final component of the brain stem. The next pons nuclei I would like you to know is, as far as the pons is concerned is the nuclei that's involved in urination. So urination, the proper term for that as far as anatomy and physiology is concerned is the term micturition. So micturition is the process of urination. So what we have within the pons, again, part of this pons nuclei, is what's referred to as the pontine storage center and the pontine micturition center. So what these centers will do, or what these pons nuclei will do, is it's going to communicate with the cerebral cortex as well as sacral regions of the spinal cord. So in other words, when we look at the length of the spinal cord, we're focusing on the sacral part of the spinal cord, S1 to S5. This is all part of the micturition reflex. So what this will provide is it will allow us the ability to control urination. So when we feel the urge to urinate, if the time is not ideal, you don't have a bathroom nearby, well, the fact that we have these pons nuclei, the pontine storage center and the pontine micturition center will allow us to control whether or not we urinate. Now, this center, by the way, these micturition centers are not yet fully developed in very, very young children. So in infants, for example, or very young toddlers, this is not yet fully mature. So these individuals, these very young children, will not have the ability to control the urge to urinate. So until that occurs, until the connection between the cerebral cortex and these urination centers or micturition centers have fully mature, only then will the child have the ability to control the urge to urinate. So what I'd like to do is show you this posterior view Take note of the cerebellar peduncle, and here is your middle cerebellar peduncle, once again, consisting of these transverse fibers that run horizontally, linking the pons with the cerebellum. The third and most inferior component of the brainstem is the medulla oblongata, which can simply be referred to as the medulla. The medulla oblongata is continuous with the spinal cord, so inferior to the medulla will be the spinal cord. All communication between the brain and the spinal cord will involve tracks that ascend or descend through the medulla. So for example, if we're looking at ascending tracks and it begins at the level of the spinal cord and its final destination will be the cerebral cortex. So these ascending tracks beginning at the spinal cord will have to go through the medulla, through the pons, 
through the midbrain and eventually reaching the cerebral cortex. Now, if we're looking at descending tracts, for example, descending tracts beginning at the cerebral cortex and its final destination is the spinal cord, well, these descending tracts will begin at the cerebral cortex, will then eventually arrive at the midbrain through the pons, through the medulla, and then finally reaching the destination of the spinal cord. Now, we have a structure called the decussation of the pyramids, and this will result in the contralateral motor movement. So let's find this decussation of the pyramids. So we'll obviously focus on the medulla oblongata, and right here is their decussation of the pyramids. And once again, this is going to result in the contralateral motor movement. So if we turn to this image on the left-hand side, Here's your primary motor cortex, and this, again, is the region of your cerebral cortex that will control skeletal muscle movement. And this is specifically the right primary motor cortex. So what we're looking at are descending tracks. So as these descending tracks, these projection fibers, as they arrive at the midbrain, they will go through the midbrain at the cerebral peduncle. Remember, these are pillar-like structures of white matter because this is what these tracts are. They're myelinated axons arriving at the pons, through the medulla, and eventually reaching the decussation of the pyramids. Or we could just simply say pyramidal decussation. Whatever the case may be, it will cross over to the opposite side and eventually reaching your skeletal muscles of your left hand. And this is a good example of that contralateral motor movement. Now, one thing I want to point out about the descending tract, we refer to the descending tract as the corticospinal tract, which I hope makes sense. Cortico means the cortex, and spinal is the spinal cord. Now, the medulla oblongata is linked or connected to the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So if we turn to this image on the top right hand corner, here once again is your cerebellar peduncle and here is your inferior cerebellar peduncle linking the medulla with the cerebellum. Now what we find in addition to these tracts, we also will have gray matter. We will have nuclei and we refer to those again as centers. So this medulla oblongata will contain centers for the coordination and control of various visceral, which we can also say autonomic, functions, and as well as many visceral or autonomic reflexes. And these are very important visceral functions and reflexes. So one of the centers I would like you to know is the cardiovascular centers. And once again, this is found in the medulla. We have two, we have the cardiac and we have the vasomotor center. So this cardiac center is what's going to regulate heart rate. In other words, how fast will our heart beat? Basically beats per minute. It will also control the force of contraction. How much force will our heart beat? That's all regulated by this cardiac center. Another center that's part of the CV center is the vasomotor center. This will regulate the distribution of blood flow. So how does it do that? Well, it does that by changing the diameter of the blood vessel. So in other words, vasoconstriction or vasodilation. And this will regulate blood pressure. So these details you will be discussing next semester in Bio 224 when you talk about the cardiovascular organ system. Another center found in the medulla oblongata is the medullary respiratory center. So one of the things I mentioned in the previous slide is in the pons, we have the pontine respiratory group, one of those pontine nuclei that I would like you to know. So it turns out that this pontine respiratory group will control the activity 
of the medullary respiratory center. Once again, this is found in the medulla. So by doing that, it will control the rate of our breaths. In other words, how many breaths do we take in a minute? It will also control the depth of our breathing. Do we take a deep breath or do we take a shallow breath? This is all part of these respiratory centers. In addition, we also have the vomiting center and as well as deglutition center. Incidentally, deglutition is the process of swallowing. So our ability to swallow is because of the center found in the medulla. Other reflex centers found in the medulla will be sneezing and coughing. So any damage to the medulla oblongata, we will permanently have to be on a ventilator. Why? Because we've lost the ability to control our breathing. In addition, we can no longer vomit, nor can we swallow, nor can we sneeze or cough because these visceral functions and reflexes, once again, are all found in the medulla oblongata. So the last image I'd like to point out is the cerebellar peduncle. And we've already covered the superior, the middle, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle, once again, is what's going to connect or link the medulla with the cerebellum.